Stop blaming the heckin' sandwich. Is the reverse mortgage the problem or is it the delivery or consumer misunderstanding? To answer that, we have Dan Holquist in our exclusive interview. Welcome back to the Industry Leader Update. Dan, earlier this month, you wrote a column entitled Stop Blaming the Heckam Sandwich, which caught my attention. Where was that most unique analogy born? Yeah, it's kind of interesting that it all started with a conversation with a journalist several years ago, and it turns out somebody wasn't happy with their reverse mortgage. Clearly, they weren't given the product that they thought they, the originator had promised. And so I just very quickly replied, listen, if I walk into a restaurant and the wait staff sells me on their great double cheeseburger, this thing's fantastic. And then they bring me a chicken sandwich. Well, where should I place the blame? And of course the journalist laughed. And I said, no, seriously, the chicken sandwich is great. The chicken sandwich did nothing wrong. And only a lunatic would blame the sandwich for poor service. But that's entirely what we do with the reverse mortgage all the time. The public complains about the reverse mortgage. The product is great. So make sure you place the blame where it belongs. Well, Dan, I have to say right here, uh, this Popeye's chicken sandwich is amazing. Um, I, I ordered it online on my mobile app. Uh, it was there at the restaurant with a, a friendly uh, employee to meet me and hand me the bag. But they did forget the napkins. So um, I just have to say that. Well, see, that's the problem with Popeyes. They are the gold standard of chicken sandwiches. It's a fantastic sandwich, but sometimes the service is poor, right? And mm. so you're kind of playing right into the analogy. I, by the way, got a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. Mm. It's not a Popeyes sandwich. I don't think it's as good, but boy, the service is outstanding, right? You probably got napkins in your order too. So the chicken sandwich has been, I thought it was a great analogy because I think um, when you used it with that reporter, I think you drove home a very important point. Um, what are some of the service and delivery issues that we see with the Heckam sandwich per se? Well, we could talk about the sandwich size versus the cost. So we could go that direction. Sure. Uh, we could say, hey, the consumer eats the sandwich too quickly and, and gets sick. Is, are we to blame the chicken sandwich there? Of course not. Mm -hmm. Right, there needs to be some personal accountability on the borrower side, sure. but as far as the the servicer goes, um, or the product itself, you know, the price of it, and I know this plays well into some of the commentaries you've had on your site over the last few days. Things like uh, IMIP charges, or the Heckam Saver product, a junior sandwich, if you will, that was available for three years. True, and you know we're looking at. Well, let's talk about the plate size. Uh, you have a couple different plates, Dan. Um, let's, let's tell our viewers. This is what the reverse mortgage looked like in 2009. Okay, in 2009, the chicken sandwich filled up about 62 to 90% of the plate, plate being the home value. It looks right? like so FHA gets compensated based on the size of the plate, not based on what the consumer is consuming. Okay. Now that sandwich, uh, I noticed it's been strategically uh, and meticulously cut. What, what do those cuts represent? It has. Okay, so that was 2009. This is what we have right now. I can eat 60% of this sandwich right now. I have to actually take 40% of the sandwich, put it in a doggy bag, and I can't touch that thing for a year. But property values have been proved. All right, so this is the plate we have now. All right, so the proportions are out. They're out of whack. I, I think uh, we would all agree that maybe 2% upfront mortgage insurance premium was a little high. Knowing the sandwich size is getting smaller, the plate's getting bigger. So the state lawmakers, um, federal, law, you know, federal lawmakers, uh, politicians for that matter, and especially media talking pundits are always blaming the sandwich. Can you give us a few examples where that's happened? Uh, maybe a specific case scenario. Yeah, I occasionally get calls from some regulators or especially state attorneys generals. And so I had an interesting call with one up in, in, in New England who uh, the office called me and said, hey, we had a complaint about a reverse mortgage. Can you kind of shed some light on it? And so in the article I described what had happened is um, this was during the time the RMF had filed for bankruptcy and people were concerned, am I going to get my money? And so a consumer 
actually requested $23,000 from their line of credit and didn't get it within the five um, business days that are allotted under the HECM program. And the loan originator had told the client that they would be getting a 10% penalty check to compensate them for their troubles. Well, 10% would be $2,300. And I interrupted the attorney general's office representative and I said, okay, let me guess. They were upset that they only got $500. And he said, how did you know that? I said, well, because that's what the regulations are, but we don't always explain it properly, right? As an industry, the lender is only um, capped at $500 penalty for a late payment. So that was really, uh, so if we can go back to the analogy, I go to Popeye's and the employee doesn't really know what's in the sandwich or what happens in a particular instance. So the employee tells me something wrong about the sandwich. I get home, I'm upset because I'm not reimbursed as I thought I was gonna be. Right. I mean, that's a that's a great way of explaining it is there's always some miscommunication. It seems like everything boils down to either the loan originator didn't communicate it properly or maybe the borrower didn't receive the communication properly. Maybe the servicer didn't service the loan properly. But there's always some type of miscommunication between the borrower and the lender. You know, I, I remember one of my first jobs uh, as a young man was working at Skipper's Seafood. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I come home smelling like fish and grease every night. But I had a fun time because I was working with my high school buddies. But we were really big on training. And if you were the manager of a store serving the Heckam sandwich and you had all your employees together in a room, what, what are some of the things that you would really want to drive home um, in your training program that today are still being misunderstood and miscommunicated to the homeowner? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we're facing some issues right now with, um, you know, the foreclosure process. I would say non-borrowing spouses is still a big issue. Uh, we need to make sure we clearly explain up front in the sales process what that looks like. Um, but part of the problem is when the last borrower passes away, the heirs have to make sense of all of this. And there's really not a lot of literature out there to kind of help them. They have to rely on the servicer. And so that's one of the reasons why my next book actually is on what happens on the back end. If you're a surviving spouse, if you're a, um, a borrower, even late in the game who wants to know, should I make prepayments? Should I take draws? How do I read my servicing statement? Why did my rate change? Um, but especially for surviving spouses and heirs, they don't know, they didn't consume the sandwich, right? So uh, in many cases, they didn't go through counseling. And so there's a lot of confusion on the back end that maybe we can shore up with some additional education on how the servicing platform works. I was thinking about the non-borrowing spouse. I think one particular piece of information that's very important is I think a lot of homeowners are not being told that you have a non-borrowing spouse, they can remain in the property um, if they meet the obligations uh, of, of, the, of the loan, maintain the property, keep the property charges current. But I've seen some cases where they were not told what would happen to the line of credit or the princ available principal limit in the HACM. What, what, is, what happens when that non-borrowing spouse passes? Because I've got my sandwich and I thought it tasted good. Yeah, the sandwich goes away, doesn't it? And so that's one of those things that we need to explain to non-borrowing spouses is that disbursements are not to be made on behalf of anyone other than the borrower. When the last borrower dies, and it's not just the line of credit, it's a tenure, a term payment, um, it, even the life expectancy set aside. And that's something that needs to be addressed is, hey, the life expectancy set aside was designed to pay property charges over time. When the last borrower passes away, so does the life expectancy set aside. So if I was um, a, a non-borrowing spouse, and let's just say my husband was deathly ill, it might behoove him to maybe look at making some disbursements ahead of time so his wife can ride out that transition period. Exactly. Very important. What are some of the other uh, delivery issues? So there's a, a definitely a supply chain. You know, We've got the chicken patties being shipped to Popeyes or Chick-fil-A <laughs> or to the lender. Um, we've got the point of service where the product is being delivered to the homeowner. Are there any other areas in that chain that we need to be aware of and be more um, mindful of in the HECM supply chain? Yeah, I've actually been kind of vocal about the what I would call multiple table appraisals, right? 
Uh, when ordering a chicken sandwich, you're required to pay an additional $5.75 up front to have your table analyzed and the size of the plate. Uh, so, you know, you could make that same analogy that since 2018, we've got the FDA is out there uh, determining what the value of the plate is. And I think there's some problems with that. Um, we have challenges with meal seasoning, right? If you want to continue the analogy, uh, we're no longer to ser allowed to serve chicken sandwiches to somebody who's had a meal in the last 12 months. Right. There are some complications and I make fun of this. I'm, I'm poking fun at some of the regulatory burdens, but they were necessary, right? They're complex, but we need to explain them properly. Um, so don't get me wrong. The sandwich is great. It tastes terrific. Now I haven't had a chance to eat mine yet because I've been speaking, but the chicken sandwich is outstanding, but we all know it could be better. Right. I think it could be priced a little bit better. And I think some of the hurdles at the restaurant could be eliminated. I agree. I mean, if I'm uh, lactose intolerant, I probably want to tell Popeyes to hold the mayo, uh, even though it's my favorite part of the sandwich. Um, so if, if I'm um, if I'm intolerant to my equity being spent down and my air is getting less, I should probably tell uh, and the loan and the restaurateur or the, the person at the counter should be asking. Is that important to you? The only thing I'll add is, you know, we've talked a little bit about the junior sandwiches recently. The Heckam Saver, I loved the Heckam Saver. What an outstanding product, but it was only available from 2010 to 2013. Now, where would we go from here to have a junior sandwich? It would have to be pretty small, right? So there's a, a problem with that, but I'm a Burger King guy and the Whopper Junior is an outstanding sandwich. It's just not big enough for most people that want to eat. Right. It's maybe appropriate for a late night snack, but should there be a junior version? Maybe, you know, that, that's a possibility. But um, right now we're basically getting the principal limits of the Heckam Saver, uh, but paying the costs of the Heckam Standard. So we're almost at the same point in the PLF factors as the Heckam Saver was, yet we're paying the full boat. Right. Point taken. Well, Dan, uh, thank you very much for the analogy. Um, I, I, I cannot wait to uh, finish this fantastic, you know, I'll, I'll, mm. amazing. That's a good sandwich. Maybe not fantastic as good as yours, but my service was better. <laughs> your service, you got napkins in your bag and I didn't. Well, thank you so much for this analogy. And I think, um, you know, for those watching, I think plagiarize Dan's analogy when you're explaining the reverse mortgage to people too. It's like, you can say it's like a chicken sandwich. You know, if someone uh, shouldn't be eating chicken, they probably shouldn't order a chicken sandwich. Of course they're gonna complain, you know? So we wanna make sure that the menu selection fits the needs and the desires of the customer. And so I really appreciate this, Dan. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll have some other chicken sandwich discussions in the future. <laughs> Shannon. All right, thank you. And folks, that wraps up another tasty episode of Heckam World. Um, and we were glad to have Dan Holquist, to have him return as a guest again. We always appreciate that. If you have any comments about how tasty your chicken sandwich is or how we can better sell the Heckam sandwich, leave your comments in the comment section below. And please share this video so other people can see this tasty episode as well. And don't forget, we have a YouTube channel where you can subscribe. And if you appreciate the work that we put together today, we're that we've tortured you with food on camera, uh, be sure to smash that like button as well. And each and every week we have reverse mortgage news on the go. All you gotta do is put in those earbuds and you can catch the nation's only weekly podcast with reverse mortgage news and commentary. Apple users can listen and subscribe on iTunes. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to return next week for more reverse mortgage news, commentary, and analysis here at Hackam World.